Um, real quick before we jump into all the great questions that you provided, I just wanted to give a quick overview. NBA 2K13 will be available on October 2nd for Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, PSP, PC, Wii, and Wii U version will be coming out this holiday season. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Uh, we've got a couple general to kick off, and then we're going to get into some more game specifics. Uh, question number one, is this a brand new engine? Uh, I'll take that one. This is Eric Heitz. Uh First off, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to come and listen to us uh, talk about NBA 2K13. Really appreciate it. Uh, getting to the question, uh, engines are very uh, – it's, it's a term that's commonly used in the industry with little understanding of what – what it truly means, um, you know, you have you have physics engines, you have graphics engines. So to say, to ask a broad question, is there a new engine? Uh, we it's getting to the end of the product. We all know that. Um, so our is not in creating an, an overarching new engine for the product. You know, as we get to the end of the current life, life cycles. Um, that being said, we do have a number of new systems within the game. I'm sure Mike will talk more about those on the the gameplay side, animation side. Um, but as far as an overarching engine, no, there's nothing in regards to that area new, but we did, you know, iterate on a lot of things, making the game feel very very new and very fresh. Great. Next question. Uh, this might be hard to answer. What one thing has the dev team most excited this year? Why should fans be excited too? Uh, I'll take that one again. I think um, this year represents the single biggest uh, annual upgrade that we've ever had as far as uh, new features and just incremental you know, improvements in all of the modes we offer in the game. Uh, a lot of years we tend to add you know, the Jordan Challenge or NBA's Greatest, and a couple modes will get you know, kind of cast off with you know, just not having time to do it. Obviously, putting out a game every 12 months makes it very difficult uh, to touch on everything. Uh, but this year, you know, more than any other in the past, and I've been doing this for over 10 years now here, uh, is that you know, we really did hit on everything this year. We have the My Team mode, which hasn't gotten a lot of discussion publicly yet, uh, but I think is probably the strongest feature in the game this year. It's a lot of fun uh, for basketball players. They've never seen anything like it, and I think it brings a lot to table. So for me personally, I think My Team is going to be a bit of a surprise this year for the fans. With the popularity and success of NBA 2K11 and 2K12, how difficult has it been to continue to live up to the expectations of fans for a fresh experience each time? I'll take that one. Hi, uh, guys. This is Mike. Um, you know, I think that's a, it's a good question. I think that the fan base, in some regard, we, we may never be able to live up to their expectations because um, they want, you know, the world, and, and, and rightly so. Um, but, you know, I think that one of the things about, about this team is that we are a very, very passionate team and a team that um, we like to pride ourselves on the fact that we have the best sim on the market and that we never want to we never want to rest. We never want to kind of settle for okay. So we're striving to make the best game every year, and I think that the fans' expectations and, and all the feedback that we get from year to year is what drives us to make the best game possible. So we want to thank the fans, and um, we hope that they're going to really enjoy 13 as well. Great. And moving into some questions that we got regarding Jay-Z and the soundtrack, this question is, well, now earlier this summer, Sean Jay-Z Carter was serving as executive producer of NBA 2K13. What influences has Sean brought to the development of the game? So when we first started working with Jay-Z, I wasn't, I wasn't quite sure what to expect, and I'm sure a lot of you felt that way when we first announced that he was you know, EPing the game this year. Um, after meeting with Jay and his team, we quickly learned that he, he, doesn't, he had absolutely no interest in just putting his name on the box. He, if he was going to be there in that space, he wanted to be heavily involved in the development of the game, um, which, again, I wasn't totally sure how to take you know, right off the bat. But after we met with him, it was very clear that he was a huge fan of the game, He's obviously a very savvy businessman, um, and he has, in, in my opinion, he has his finger on the pulse of, you know, what what consumers want in in many different markets. So to align ourselves with him uh, was clearly a very strong thing for us to do, and just the input he gave into the game was huge. As far as, you know, obviously he hand selected the soundtrack, which is phenomenal this year. Uh, he gave us a ton of input on presentation, uh, just game modes, and, and just feedback from him and his team that was very valuable to us. And there's a lot of stuff that I think is in the game that you really haven't heard a lot about yet, specifically on the presentation side. Um, we have you know, music videos of um, all of the songs in the soundtrack, and they're cut up with in-game audio, kind of like our teaser system that we have. Uh, very, artistic, very artistic things, uh, things that don't 
you don't really see in a traditional sports game, and I think that really goes to show just the culture that our game, you know, presents this year. And I think a lot of sports games really miss out on that, but I do think we hit the nail on the head with that this year. So given the fact that Jay-Z is executive producer, does that mean that the Nets will get a bit of a ratings boost? <laughs> um, no, no, no. Jay, Jay's very real, and uh, I think we're even more real in, in terms of how serious we take making the video games. So there were no friendly boosts to, uh, to the Nets or any other team for that matter. So they, they had a great summer, so they're obviously considerably better than they were last year, uh, but uh, everything is fair. Right on. Uh, now moving into some questions about uh, Team USA and Legends in NBA 2K13. How exactly is the game structured with the Legends this year? So all of the Legends teams that we had in the game last year returned this year. Um, as I know we put out there, we did add a few teams. We added the 2000-2001 76ers, which is Allen Iverson in his prime. A very, very fun team to play with and, and obviously a hugely requested uh, player that we didn't have in the game last year. Um, alongside him, I think we have 10 of his 11 teammates. We only missed out on one bench player who just didn't want to play with us. It happens from time to time. Um, and obviously beyond that, we have the classic dream team in the game, the first time in 20 years that they've all been together in a game on that team. Uh, we have the 2012 USA Olympic team that won the gold medal in London. Uh, so as far as legends go, they're all available off the bat. You don't have to do any crazy unlocking or codes or anything. Uh, you can just buy the game on day one, go right to Team Select, and pick any teams you want. So it's very much available for our fans. Can you tell us more about what went into the inclusion of the Dream Team in this year's game? Uh, the inclusion, I, I think our fans got to see almost a little insight into the game development as the roster for that thing pretty much unfolded right before their very eyes. Um, I know we put out the, the initial screenshot and the lineup, and, and Pippen was missing. And so people kind of got to see firsthand what the power of social media can do in, in getting Pippen to kind of change his mind and rejoin us, uh, completing the roster. Uh, beyond that, the person we were struggling with before that, obviously Charles Barkley is someone who we wanted to have in the game for a number of years. And the way we actually got him in the game was just a, a simple meeting with Jay, <coughs> pardon me, where we... You know, we said, Jay, we're doing this, this Dream Team feature. This is going to be great. It's an Olympic year. And we said, okay, but we don't have Pip and we don't have Barkley. <clears throat> and he was just up in arms. He was like, well, you can't, you can't do this feature without Barkley. I mean, this is ridiculous. And uh, the man has contacts. And he basically pulled out his phone and got the deal done with us and with Barkley. So uh, Jay's, Jay's, Jay's been involved in many ways that people would never guess. And that was just a little hint at uh, one of the ways in which he helped us make this game you know, as, gr as great as it is. Thank you, Eric. Next question, how does the team go about studying the movement and tendencies of older players, like the ones on the 1992 Dream Team, which is included in NBA 2K13's roster? Uh, I think the funny thing about that is that um, you know, a lot of us on the team are kind of old farts, and we've been, you know, we grew up watching these guys. So it's, I think, you know, the studying of the movement and the tendencies, we, we kind of grew up watching them. We know how they're, we know their games, and, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's what, uh, we grew up loving the game, and that's what we, we know so a lot of it's just from our own minds but you know a lot of it too is you know we're all we're all spread out all over the country we, we came from different places we all follow different teams and also we have a great partner in the NBA who's who's awesome at getting us um, footage and, and game film and all kinds of things that we can study and you know it's a big part of, uh, of our jobs as, um, as producers and designers is just to, to watch watch game tape and, and study these guys and, and get everything to be as authentic as possible in our game. Do you worry that the Dream Team will be more popular than today's players? Uh, I don't. I don't personally. I don't worry about that at all. I mean, if, if that if that quote unquote problem happens, that means we hit the uh, to use the phrase again, the nail on the head as far as what people want to play in this year's game. Uh, obviously, today's NBA is wildly popular. There's a huge amount of interest in playing with the Dream Team again. So, if it became that popular, I think that's great for us and for our fans. Great. Now let's transition into some of the modes uh, in NBA 2K13. Can you give us an overview of the changes made to My Career Mode? So My Career Mode, and for those who aren't up to speed on it, was formerly My Player Mode. Uh, it got a rename this year. A lot of huge upgrades to it. Uh, that would take me quite a while to discuss, so let me go over some of the higher level, basically the big vision I had for the mode this year. Um, and obviously the last couple of years we've added a lot of really cool features in there with you know press conferences and enhancements to the teammate grade and just all these things that 
make the mode more about you. We've added endorsements. We had the commercials last year. Uh, this year was all about tying it together and having your actions cause more reactions both in and out of game. And one, one such way you can do that this year is we have a new GM sit down feature where you can go in and meet with your team GM at any point during the season or your career. And you can tell him things like, you really don't like the job coach is doing and that he should be fired, or that you're demanding a trade, or that you're not getting enough touches on offense, or that you wanted to trade the starter at your position because you know, you're having trouble breaking into the starting lineup. And the really cool aspect of this is the GM will respond to you based on your stature, within, not, just, not just within the team, but within the league. So if you're a rookie and you're coming in there making all these demands, he's going to kind of scoff at you, uh, think you're a bit of a prima donna, but if you're going in there with a you know, a Kobe Bryant, LeBron James level of play, he's going to be really serious about what you're saying. He's going to take those things to heart. And if he likes you enough, because you can kind of raise up your, your likability with the GM, uh, then he'll start acting on those things. Uh, and there's over 50 different conversations you can have, different topics, I should say. The conversations branch in many different paths. Um, and it's really, it's really interesting because at the end of the day, it's a way for you to kind of pull the strings on your career uh, in a full, you know, environment situation where you're interacting in a back and forth conversation rather than just selecting things in a menu. So I thought that was really cool. Um, other examples of ways we've improved the mode is we spent, and Mike can probably speak to this later, we spent a considerable amount of time on the AI within the mode. Um, obviously we've done a tremendous job, in my opinion, of just gameplay in the last few years. I do think in my player mode in years past, the AI was it, it was a little problematic. I mean, the AI plays exceptionally well when you're playing in a quick game where you, you're always a ball handler. But when you're playing off-ball in my career, I think it really exposed some areas that we needed to do a lot of work in. And the gameplay team definitely recognized that. They definitely spent a lot of time uh, just improving on that. And one other couple areas I want to touch is just in commentary. I, I identified commentary as, as, an, as a need for this mode after last year's game. Took it home, played it. It's really one of those hindsight is 2020 situations. Um, and, and, and the mode is all about me, right? So I, I, just, I didn't feel like I was getting enough commentary about me. So you're going to hear the commentators assessing my career. So if I'm in a press conference and I say something outlandish, in the following game you're going to see the whole three-man booth going back and forth about what I said and how my teammates reacted and how it's shaping my career. And it's, just a, it's a feedback loop of everything that you do, you're going to get feedback, whether it be in commentary, uh, whether it's in our new social media feature on the front end, which is a place where fans and celebrities and players and legends all just kind of tweet at you and give you, give you these messages uh, to kind of give you, you know, a feedback of how you're doing in your career. So, I mean, the changes to my career are huge. I could go on forever, but I'm sure there's more questions on this, so I want to give it all away. But yeah, my career is a big change this year, and I hope the fans love it. And plenty more questions there are. Uh, moving on to the next one. The developer insight from my career says the AI has been improved. Along those same lines, has the grading been tweaked at all as last season the game would frequently penalize you for things that really weren't on you, such as getting docked for transition baskets when you haven't crossed midcourt? Yeah, that's, that's clearly referencing the teammate grade logic. Uh, and that's something that was, you know, an, another year under the belt just makes it that much more solid. Um, and that's a very serious portion of the mode for us because that's obviously all you're doing when you're on the court is you're getting assessed. And if you're getting assessed improperly, that doesn't reflect well on, you know, the overall quality of the mode. So we did spend, again, a considerable amount of time working on a lot of those edge cases, uh, you know, like the one, you know, shown here about transition baskets when you haven't crossed midcourt. Um, more than any other year, QA really struggled to find bugs in the teammate grade logic. Um, and that's partially because we did spend the first three or four months of the cycle with an engineer just kind of going off these one-off cases that, while they happened somewhat rarely, when they did happen, they were you know, rage, controller, throwing, inducing, and I totally get that. And that's why we invested the time to improve it. So I do think people will enjoy the enhancements there this year. Will we see a more seamless experience like last year, complete with commercials for upcoming games based on your career path? Yeah, presentation, clearly a strong suit for the NBA 2K franchise. Um, I actually really wrangled them into my career mode this year as far as making, you know, the magic they do fit within the scope of my mode. So. You are going to see things like, you know, better teasers on upcoming games and highlighting you as a player. And whenever you get a billboard or commercial, you're going to see, you know, interstitial commercials between quarters in the games highlighting the work that you were a part of. And just really all bringing it back to you, but while still giving you that true broadcast presentation. So 
presentation just within the scope of my player my road, huge upgrade this year. And we touched on this last question a little bit, but um, Mike, you chime in here if there's anything else that you could add. Uh, the question is, the My Player mode has been expanded with more cutscenes, billboards, and menu-like features. But how has the on-court experience been changed, including teammate AI and player performance grades? I think um, Eric kind of hit on it earlier, but if I were to sum it all up, I think the main thing is that the AI is now just really more aware of you and what you like to do. Um, we worked on our VIP system a lot this year, and that's just a system that records the way the user plays the game, um, you know, kind of where he likes to take shots, where he likes to go, how he likes to attack the basket, those kinds of things. And we worked that into the AI so that your teammates will actually run plays to get you into those spots where you like to score. And on the other end of the floor, the defense will actually, um, you know, they know your tendencies, so they're going to try and try and play you for those tendencies and try to steer you the opposite way and, and get you to do something you don't want to do. So it's just uh, it's a lot smarter on both ends of the floor. Um, other things people talked about and complained about was, um, like you said, the screen, uh, either for the ball handler or off ball. Sometimes they wouldn't use it. Um, they do a lot better job using the screens now. Um, and things like just your teammate AI in general, where if you pass to an open guy, he's going to take that shot now. So last year, sometimes you'd pass to a guy, and he'd, he would just kind of dork around with the ball, or he'd pass it to someone else who, who wasn't open, or something like that. And, and those are the kinds of things that we tried to clean up and, and make it feel like, you know, you're playing with guys who are smart, who are going to who are going to work with you and, and work with you to succeed. Um, and one other thing you talked about, um, uh, the teammate, the, the player performance stuff, uh, there's a new feature called uh, Coach Approval, which I think is pretty cool. And that's just, um, what it is is if, you, you know, if you're doing dumb stuff on the court, like you're, you're chucking up full, sh full court shots all the time, or you're just taking a lot of bad shots, the coach will actually bench you now, uh, and, you'll, and you'll lose minutes. Uh, or if you are on the other side, if you're doing a good job and you're taking good shots and you're you know, you're doing a good job for your team, then it'll actually give you more minutes. So it's a, it's a nice little reward system for the user as well. Next question asks, what changes will be in association mode? Uh, association mode is, is another feature that hasn't gotten a lot of talk this year, whether it be from us or from the media yet. Um, but we definitely did a lot of improvements in the mode this year. I think the first and foremost thing worth mentioning is we are CBA compliant with the new CBA that the NBA and the players union signed after the lockout last year. Um, that in itself uh, was a huge undertaking because there were a ton of rule changes, and if you don't have the rules right in a franchise mode, you really have nothing. Um, so we did spend a lot of time making sure that that is correct uh, for all the years moving forward within the mode. Um, beyond that, we have another feature that's called Start Today, and this is a cool little feature where at any point during the NBA season, you can say, I want to start my franchise with today's real-life date, and it will basically fill up the season up to that point with all of the real stats and standings and injuries. So you can basically you know, get the game on Christmas Day, start on December 25th, and play out the rest of the season from that point with everything real from the NBA, which is a pretty cool little feature. Um, another thing we added is something called Total Sim Control. And this is one of those features where I look back at last year's game and, and years past and, and feel like those games were naked in this regard. Um, this feature allows you to go in and set up how your team plays when you choose to simulate games. And what I mean by that is you can choose who you want your three top offensive options to be. Uh, you can choose what type of defense your team plays, whether you're a, you know, a Mike D'Antoni offense or more of a slow, a slow-paced half-court offense. And it, it really allows you to utilize the team that you've custom built you know, in our simulator where, as in years past, and this gets back to my, my naked comment, is that you would just simulate the game and, you know, whatever you got, you got, and that didn't necessarily take advantage of the team you had built. So for people who are, you know, the true stem heads, they're really, really going to like what we've done there in this regard. One new feature we have in online is, is the My Team feature, which is another feature that I, I, know, I, know, I know I mentioned earlier, it hasn't gotten a lot of press yet. Uh, this is a really cool feature where you are basically building up your very own team of, of players, whether they be current day players, and we also use our full lineup of Legends players in this mode. Uh, you're basically purchasing players for this from the market or getting players from packs, and you're building a team that you're competing against other players online with. And we kind of have a tiered setup. Uh, it's called Road to the Playoffs, where you basically play these 12-game seasons, and you have to win a certain number of games within each season to move up to the next seed. Uh, so, for example, you start off, you know, quote, out of the playoffs, and the first season is 12 games, and if you win three of those 12 games, you move up to the eighth seed. And every time you move up, you're going to get rewards, and obviously your team's going to get better as you play through it. Um, and it's really just, more than anything, like, I, I, I enjoy playing online, but I always felt 
a little hollow after playing online. Like I would spend half an hour to have a great game, and then I would have nothing to show for it other than you know a win or a loss on my record. And this mode allows me to play head-to-head -head online games and feel like I'm making progress in something. My team's getting better. I'm moving up. You know, I'm building up my record towards moving to the next seed. Um, so it's really a chance for people to, <clears throat> you know, get get satisfaction out of playing games. And also, it kind of brings you back to that that time, you know, when I was a kid and I would just go to the store and I would buy packs of baseball cards or you know basketball cards. And you're basically buying these crates that have players in them. And uh, it's just a it's that cool thing where you never know what you're going to get. You know, are you going to get the Kobe in this one? Or are you going to get the retro classic Shaq? Uh, it's just a lot of fun building building your team, and I think it's a strong feature for the game this year. Will NBA 2K13 allow the classic teams to compete online against other teams? Yes, fully. Are the U.S. Dream teams available for head-to-head -head online play? Yes. Will you be able to use your own My Player in the team up mode this year? Not in team up mode, but we did add a new mode called My Player Pickup Game. Or my, I'm sorry, they're My Player Blacktop Game. Uh, and it's very similar to the pickup games that we had in years past. Uh, obviously, your My Player is a much bigger focus with the game this year. Uh, we added a whole new casual clothing system, just a continued effort as our, our cultural improvements with the, within the game. Um, we have, you know, thousands of items that you can purchase for your player, whether it be, you know, jewelry or, you know, clothes or shoes. Uh, you can use our 2K Shoe Creator, which is a brand new feature in the game this year that allows you to create custom shoes using 45 different layers. Very, very robust. Um, but this, this My Player Blacktop is a chance for you to go three on three. You can take your My Players online. Um, and your my players are what you use in my career mode. So when you build them up there, you take those online. Uh, and it's just a, it's just another way to to express yourself and play online games with your friends. So it's it's a lot of fun. Has anything been done to don't tone down how easy it is to steal the ball in online play? Either making it harder to steal or turning the fouls called. Playing online in NBA 2K12, guys were able to hack your point guard with a center, and fouls were rarely called. Attempting steals should be risk reward. But when it came to 2K12, it was all reward for the defense. Yeah, I, I agree with that uh, statement that you said. And I think that's something that was actually, we spent a lot of time in trying, trying to tune. Uh, just the balance there, it's a tough thing to balance because, you know, some people like to spam that steal button. And when you're getting 100 fouls of, you know, every game, then it just feels kind of bad. But I think we found a good balance there. And one thing I do want to mention also with regard to, um, you know, problems like this is that we, we spent some time this year making uh, what we call post-ship tunables. And, the thing about that is um, usually in the past when we had issues like this arise, we'd have to rely on a gameplay patch to be able to uh, tune the game on the, you know, after it shipped. And one thing we, we can do now is um, whenever we, we see feedback, feedback like this or any other thing that we want to change after we ship, we can tune it on the fly. And it basically come down, comes down to the, to the user like a roster update. So we can kind of tune and tweak the game as we get feedback on it, which is really cool for us this year. Uh, now moving into some more gameplay-specific uh, questions. Uh, since there's a new passing system, does that mean that we will be able to finally run fast breaks? Will players now continue to run when they receive the ball rather than stop? Uh, yeah, that was a big focus for us this year. Passing in general got uh, quite a bit of an overhaul, and um, you know, Rob Jones worked on it a lot with one of our gameplay engineers, and I feel like it's in a lot better place now. Uh, you'll see a lot uh, better passes and receives and receptions um, in fast break situations, and you'll see more breaks. I thought the passing in last year's game was the best of any sim to date. I see that bounce passes and lobs are now available. Are those situational, or can they be executed at will? A little bit of both. Um, there's a bounce pass mechanic now, so you can do that uh, whenever you want. Um, but as well, we, there are times you know, we, we want to make the best pass for the user. So if you just hit A, uh, the pass button, sorry, A on 360, cross on PS3, um, you're just going to get the best pass in the situation. So you'll see bounce passes in situations where it just makes sense also for the user. Flopping has been added to the game this year. As someone who feels that flopping has become the scourge of the real-life NBA, why was it incorporated into the game, and what are the in-game benefits to such fakery? Are there significant disadvantages to attempting this overall theatrical and cowardly act? If so, uh, what are they, and how has the team ensured that flopping won't be abused by gamers? Wow, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> I like how it's word, worded. Um, first of all, I agree. I hate flopping. I'm a big uh, Jeff N. Gundy fan. I, I love that when he calls it out every time it happens in real life. Um, 
but you know it's something that does happen in the league and something that we you know we, we want our game to be as authentic as possible and so it's one of those things we just thought we would add it's definitely not an exploit like you can't run around just flopping all over the place expecting to get charge calls uh, but it does add a nice wrinkle to the game that as a defender if you time it just right you can encourage the ref to call that charge call but more often than not you're just going to flop without a reward and you're just going to fall down you'll be out of the play and, and the offense will punish you for it so i think we did a good job balancing it this year Next question is, for the most part, signature skills are locked down to specific game situations. Was that a consideration from the start or added in, added in as a way to balance them out and give the game more of a simulation feel? Oh, no. Signature skills was definitely meant to be that way from the beginning. When we first met and talked about the feature and brainstormed about it, we basically were, were trying to figure out how can we make guys play more like their real life selves? How can we make you know each player, not just the stars, but the guys on the, you know, eighth, ninth, tenth guys off the bench, how can we make them matter? Because in real life they matter. They, you know, they play a role in the team. And so um, you know, we figured the only way to do that was really to not to, to move away, I guess, from some of the, the way we do things in the past, which is just looking at ratings and numbers and, and you know, doing things that way. And we needed to have the signature skills actually affect the game in different ways. And so that's why you'll see things like, um, I guess we call them rule breaking, is where they'll, they'll, they'll in certain situations, those signature skills will pop up and they'll be much more impactful for the user. What are the dev team's personal favorite signature skills and why? Well, I can't speak for the entire team, but I know that uh, Zach Timmerman, he worked a lot on six skills. His favorite one is dead eye. I think the main reason for that is because when we play lunch ball, he likes to yell dead eye every time he shoots. Um, but he also likes brick wall, I think, because he says it's, it's cool to, to have uh, – a six skill that actually brings you new animation content, and that's one that you know you'll see if you guys hit the hard screen that he'll lay out the the guy trying to run through it. Um, I know Rob and uh, Rob Jones and Jordan Sapita, they're big dimer guy. They like uh, the dimer signature skill because it, it boosts your teammates. And um, I know Jordan's running with the Clippers this year, so he he wants to use CP3 a lot. Uh, for me, it's probably Shot Creator. I'm a Bulls fan, and I love Derrick Rose, and I, I just like to be able to do moves off the bounce and and uh, get shots off like he does. So, you know, I think everyone's got a different one. What's yours, Eric? My favorite? I like corner specialists. I like to sit in the corner and shot <laughs> threes all day. It's a lot of fun. Are player-to-player -player motion dynamics seeing a change this year in terms of graphic interactions? I think what that question is asking is, is the contact stuff, so I'll, I'll speak to that. Um, we, we worked on this thing. We introduced it last year. I remember even on this call we talked about this dynamic shot generator, and, and the whole concept was is being able to stitch animations together and blend different things together to um, make them more signature. Uh, but for 2K13, we really leveraged that tech to to make it so that guys can react to different collisions and um, just the different context of a play. So when you go up, go up strong with the basket with a guy, and you get hit by a you know a big center, then you're going to see that guy bounce back and get hit and fall to the ground, maybe get hurt. Um, so there's a lot more interaction in that regard, and, and also uh, on the floor when you're dribbling, um, there's, a, there's a whole new body-up system where guys will get uh, ridden out of bounds, will get ridden, and you'll have to play off the defender. And so there's a lot more body-to-body -body contact that, to me, looks a lot better, but also I think that the, the cool thing about it is it doesn't sacrifice feel. So in the past, we've had to kind of stick you in a, a multi-actor animation, and you'd kind of be... Uh, really can just sit there and just watch it. But uh, with 2K13, you can branch out of all these things at any point, and so they feel a lot better, and they look really good, too. What was the thought process for moving dribbling moves to the right stick? And since the right stick can still be used for the shot stick, what do most of the developers um, use the right stick for now, dribbling or shooting? Well, that was a, a big, um, almost controversial change at the beginning of the year. I've always been a ice motion hater for the last couple of years, and um, it's something dribbling on the right stick is something I've, I've personally wanted to see in 2K for a long time now. Um, and you know, talking to Jeff Thomas at the beginning of the year too, he's he was a big a big proponent of you know I want to feel more connected with the ball handler. I want to feel like I'm doing the moves that it's a one to one system. And so that's what we set out to do at the beginning of of last year. And um, so we all agreed that dribbling, you know, ice motion had kind of run its course in terms of what we could get out of the system. You know, when you're doing everything on the same stick, movement and dribble moves, you just can't do certain things that uh, real-life ball handlers can do because you need to kind of decouple the two. Um, so dribbling, it just made sense to put there. And, you know, then the big question came up, you know, what do we do with the shot stick? Everyone loves the shot stick. How do we retain all that functionality? So um, 
Uh, that was one of my one of my responsibilities this year was to sit down with one of our engineers and I think we did at least four or five, six, I don't know how many different prototypes with different control schemes and we tossed them around all you know, all over the team. You know, Eric's big thing was he wanted it to be accessible for everyone, um, but he'd still be able to do the cool stuff and I think the control stick where we, we netted out with it being a, a modifier where you can toggle between shots and dribbles, it ended up being the best solution for everybody and we really like how it feels and it, it, it works out pretty well. As for um what everyone here likes to do, um, I've seen mix, a lot of mix, a mix, um, kind of mixed opinions of how it should work and how they tend to use it. And I think, you know, for Rob and myself, we are both strictly stick, so we will use the dribble, the right stick dribbling, and use the modifier to use the shot stick. I know a lot of guys will use just the dribble stick and um, use the shot button and the hop step button to do their shots. Um, Zach's a weird one. He'll do what does he do? He does dribble. He uses the right stick for dribble. And then he uses the shot button for all jumpers, but in the post he uses the, the shot stick for post exactly shot. That's how I use it. Yeah, so Eric does that too. So it's, you know, I think the, the big thing for us is we want people, people to be able to do whatever they want to do and, and kind of customize the controls to the liking. Um, that's another thing too is if, um, if you want it to work like last year, you can also have an option to, to toggle the shot stick and the dribble stick to be flipped so the control stick can be uh, shots by default and dribbles with the modifier. So you can kind of play it any way you want. That's great. That pretty much answers our next question about uh, is there a way to turn off the control stick and go back to the old shot stick. Will the changes made to the right analog stick controls, example dribbling moves being mapped, um, may, um, I'm sorry, will the changes made to the right analog stick controls this year make the game more difficult to pick up for new players? Um, that's a definite no. Um, that's something that we've, we did a lot of kind of focus group testing on and, and I think that for the, the casual person, I think typically they want to be able to, to kind of do whatever they, you know, just wiggle the sticks and get something cool to happen, and that's what we saw. So <clears throat> actually moving the dribbling to the right stick actually allows them to do a lot of really cool stuff that they couldn't do in the past because in the past with ISO motion, you kind of had to be a bit of a, a stick jockey to get all the moves in the game to, to work. And I think with the right stick dribbling, it's, it's just kind of elevated the game for a lot of people. And, and so all the feedback that we've heard so far from uh, the community day guys and all the people that have tested the game, um, uh, and also in house, everyone just thinks that it's the right way to go, and, and it's actually a lot easier to play than, than years past. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, switching gears to being able to play NBA 2K everywhere. This year, my player interfaces with an iOS app. Do you plan on creating an Android version? What kinds of activities can 2K13 owners plan on doing on their mobiles to boost their player? Sure. So uh, interfacing with your MyPlayer this year comes in a couple of flavors. We do have the mobile app. We also have the Facebook app. Um, both of those seamlessly are integrated within the actual console game, which is pretty cool. Um, the mobile app is going to be available on iOS, um, Android, Kindle, uh, pretty much any device out there you'll be able to get a version of it. Um, and we haven't detailed a lot about what NBA 2K Air is yet. That big unveil is still coming. Um, so I don't want to spoil the fun, but I can give you a little bit and say that the mobile app is going to have a lot of you know, many type games in there where you can go in there. One is a contract signing game, or an autograph signing game, sorry, uh, where you have like a specific amount of time to, you know, sign enough autographs for the fans in line. And uh, if you're able to complete it, you get an attribute boost for the next game you play on the combo version in my career mode. So it's just lots of fun little games to keep you very in touch with your, with your my player no matter where you are in the world. Uh, moving on to a few questions about uh, AI. What improvements have been made to the AI, both on offensive and defensive end of the court. That was another one of those questions that could probably take an hour. So I'll some real quick. Um, I guess on offense, some of the biggest things are having the AI attack mismatches better, so they're smarter at recognizing those situations and capitalizing on them. Um, and also, I guess signature, making the AI more signature and making the play more like their real life counterparts was big too. And that, you know, kind of stemmed from the whole SIG skills uh, feature. We really wanted the AI to take advantage of the SIG skills that they have and um, the way they like to play in real life. So you'll see things like LeBron being more aggressive, attacking the basket more than uh, more than he did last year. Uh, guys like Kevin Durant will just pull from anywhere, um, and you can see like his his SIG skills come through. Um, stuff, stuff like that. Kobe, he's one of those guys who plays with the finesse now, especially that he's not doesn't have quite the athleticism that he used to have, and so he's got you know a huge arsenal of shots that he'll use. And, um, so so it just feels like you're playing a little more organic uh, of an opponent when you play against the AI. As for your AI teammates, uh, one of the big things that we focused on was getting them to do smart things off the ball. So um, cutting to the hoop when they're open, uh, that was something that just didn't happen enough, I think, in last year's game. And 
Uh, so they're smarter now. And they, when when you know the defense, if they cheat, the defense cheats, tries to double ball handle or something, you'll see you'll see those, uh, your teammates cutting the hoop and you get them for uh, an easy layup. Um, on the other side of the other end of the floor, defense there's a lot of stuff to um, the defensive AI. Uh, probably the biggest things are um, just position defense for the on-ball defender, just taking the right lanes, uh, being smarter of where they're shading and uh, how they're playing. Um, uh, help. You know, help defense got a big boost as well as double teams. Uh, they're smarter about their trapping. Uh, the list kind of goes on and on, but um, well, another thing I want to mention too is the defense is a lot smarter at um, recognizing their matchups. So guys, if they're playing uh, against like a Ray Allen, say off ball, they'll do a lot better job trying to deny him the ball and also crowd him and not give him that much space versus you know if they're guarding somebody who just can't shoot. So um, a lot went into AI, and uh, there's just a few things I can I can think of right now. On the ball defending was frustrating last year when the person regarding tried to attack the rim. It seemed like eventually they took you almost without fail. Will the defensive adjustments in this year's game fix that? I think it's that's one of the main areas that got a big improvement. I think in on ball defense, and uh, I think I alluded to it earlier. There's a there's a whole new body up kind of ride system that uh, that I got to work on this year. That I I, I think it's I think it's um let's see last year. Last year, two years ago, what did we do? two years ago, there was a lot of uh, bumping and stunning of the ball handler, so it just kind of knocked them back, and it felt really artificial. Um, and I think it's some of the videos that we released already for 13, uh, and what people will see in a couple weeks in the demo is that um, the game just feels a lot more like a dance between the on-ball defender and the dribbler. So um, the interactions between the two guys are a lot. Uh, just they make more sense, and they, they look more like real-life basketball, and, and it really helped us get the on-ball defender to be able to guard the on-ball, or guard the ball a lot better. So it feels better to me, and I think it's uh, something that you guys are going to like. In past versions, it seemed that the human player's shot percentages were punished way more in terms of having a defender's hand in their face, in comparison to the AI-controlled opponent having the same thing happen. They still sink so many contested shots. Do the devs notice this, and if so, has it been touched upon? Um, I think what people were seeing there is that the AI defensively is a lot quicker to react um, to say a jump shot than the average user. That's something that I, I noticed watching people play. Uh, so what, one of the things we did is we made it uh, we made separate tunables for how how much the defense impacts uh, the shooter when it's an AI defender versus a user defender to make it a little more fair to kind of compensate for that and. Uh, Another one of those things that we can also tune for ship, but I think it feels a lot better now. It feels more fair. I think that the AI, and also just the fact that the AI was closing out and, and contesting everything so so quickly was another thing that was addressed to make it feel uh, just more fair uh, when you're playing against the AI. Thank you, Mike. Uh, moving into talking a little bit about the All-Star DLC. Uh, Eric, can you tell us a little bit more about All-Star and what brought on the decision to include the All-Star Weekend events as DLC? Sure. Um, I mean, obviously, All-Star Weekend is something that we touched heavily upon at E3. Um, All-Star Weekend is, you know, it, it's our all-new Sprite Slam Dunk Contest. It doesn't at all uh, represent any of the dunk contests we've done in years past. Uh, it's the Foot Locker three-point shootout. It has the All-Star Game, the Rising Stars Challenge. Um, and the way this, 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 uh, this DLC works is that once you have it activated within your console, uh, it's actually seamlessly integrated across all the modes within your game. So anytime you're playing season mode or association mode or creating a legend mode or my career mode, anytime you get to that all-star break and you have this content activated, uh, you get to participate in those events uh, in the scope of you know, creating a legend in my career only if your player qualifies for the event. Um, as for the question is, as I think it was what brought on the decision to include it as DLC, um, this is something we wanted to do more, more or less as a thank you to our hardcore fans who go out there and pre-order the game every year, who purchase the game on day one every year. Uh, so those guys are going to get some really exclusive content that people who purchase the game later on in the year won't have access to. So that's something that, you know, like I said, it's just a thank you to those guys who support us on day one every year. Uh, we truly appreciate it, and thank you very much. And we got some questions about Connect. First one uh, in this category, what exactly can be executed with Connect voice commands? Can I call for picks on and off the ball? Oh, Connect is actually really cool. Um, you can do a lot of stuff. On offense, you can call plays, you can uh, call for timeouts, you can call quick plays, you can uh, tell your guys to cut to the basket. Uh, you can call for a screen, uh, on-ball screens, uh, not off-ball right now. Uh, that's something that we'll probably get to later in the future. Uh, defensively, you can call for double teams. Um, you can tell your teammates to pick up the ball if you're off-ball and you want someone to pick up the ball handler. Um, you can call defensive sets or you call intentional fouls. 
Uh, my player's got some things that are different to my player where you can um, you can call for a pass or you can call for an isolation. You can tell your guys to shoot the ball. Um, some general stuff. You can do subs, which is really really nice because you don't have to fiddle with the menus. You can just say, you know, bring in so and so or take out so and so. And uh, you can switch the camera. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. You can also do a Gatorade dunk thing. If, that's, a if you wanna, <laughs> that's a fun one. But uh, yeah, a lot of stuff you can do on Connect, and it's a pretty cool feature. Next question is, how much time does it take for the game to call for someone to post up and your teammate to react? Oh, it's, it's pretty much instantaneous. So it's just like using the buttons, but uh, you can do it with your voice. So it's nice and quick. Uh, I'm really curious about the use of Connect and the challenges you faced. What concerns me, though, is how well it works. Did you run into any technical issues that had to be ironed out, and at any time did you consider leaving Connect out of the game? I think that's a really good question, and it's one that we very, very much you know, have asked ourselves. Um, a couple days ago, actually, I had an interview with a reporter who asked a very astute question, and he asked that, you know, Connect has been out for a couple of years now. Why are you only putting this in now? Um, and, and for us internally, we are big supporters of Connect, but we did not want to implement something that didn't have a true benefit for our users. Um, I, I play too many games that have Connect seemingly thrown in, and it's more, it seems like it's more or less to get the little purple stripe on the box than it is to truly enhance my experience as far as playing the game. And, you know, for us, we did a lot of experimentation with, you know, the motion analysis stuff and kind of getting that to play in the game. And our game is so fast-paced to Twitch that it just wasn't, it was something you could do for fun, but it just it didn't enhance your playing experience. It wasn't beneficial to our user base. And um, that's really where we settled into the voice part of Connect, which is a great fit for our game. Uh, people who call plays know what it's like. Sometimes you have to press right on the D-pad and you have to like take your eyes off the ball. Uh, this year with Connect, our, our implementation was all about making the game more playable for the user. So calling plays is just as simple as you know calling out the play and never having to fumble through menus while you're dribbling. Um, it's just all user interface and making the game much more playable, and that's something that ultimately we were very satisfied with, and we did basically at the end of the day find a way to make the game better by using Connect, and that's why we ended up going with it. Uh, moving into a question about shoes, uh, Eric, I know you touched on this a little bit earlier, uh, but this question is, there's a lot of buzz on the Internet over the new feature in this year's game that allows you to design a custom shoe, and supposedly even order a real version through Nike. Could you tell me a bit about this feature and any other potential new features that allow the players to customize? Um, this is, you know, like I referenced earlier, a, a big part of our, our culture push this year and tying the whole, you know, basically basically real life in with the sport of basketball. Um, shoes come in two flavors this year. Nike ID is back in the fold. Uh, and like last year, we're going to have day-in-day -day releases for all of the shoes that drop, you know, within that interface. So you're going to get the LeBron 10 when it drops and the next the Kobe 8 ends. You know, the CP3, when that comes out, we'll get the new Dwayne Wade, the Jordan around All-Star time. All these shoes, if they're going to be an ID, they're going to appear in our game the day releases in the real world. Um, and within those shoes, once you customize the shoe, you can get, you basically, you get an email from us anytime you customize a Nike ID shoe. And when that email contains a direct link right to Nike ID where you can click that link and your shoe that you created within our game is going to be already populated on the Nike ID website for one-click purchasing. And it's... It's really cool is you can just create something in our game, go to the website, because we're true one-to-one -one for what their site offers. We're completely authentic in that regard as far as technologies, uh, colors, placements of logos. Um, it's all 100% accurate. It's just a fun thing for people. Um, the thing that I think people are really going to buzz over is the new 2K shoe creator. Um, Rob Jones, as many of you know, is, is a, a bit of a shoe head, and this is kind of a passion project for him. Uh, he spent the whole year with a number of members of the team you know, creating something truly unique. Um, in years past, our shoe creation has been limited to, you know, here's a shoe, and here's three parts of the shoe that you can color. Go, go change the colors. Um, but this year, like I said earlier, we have 45 different components of the shoe, up to 45. You can make one even with three or four parts if you want. Uh, it, it, it really goes down to the level of detail of, you know, I'm going to put a swoosh on the toe. I'm going to put one on, you know, the insole and put one on the bottom. I want it to be really big on the bottom. You're really like, it, it's really a sandbox as far as what you can do with this. So I'm really... Uh, excited to see what the truly creative people out there can can create with this. And of course, you can take your custom creations online in the My Player Blacktop feature that I spoke about. So uh, you will get the chance to show off your creations to the world. So very excited to see what happens here. We got a couple of Wii U questions. What sorts of features and functionality are you planning on including in the Wii U version of the game? Gameplay design via the gamepad? 
So the Wii U version, I know there hasn't been a lot of Wii U, Wii U, Wii U type information out there. It's uh, it's very much an unknown, even though it releases, and I think they said November last week. Um, so the Wii U version of our game is a complete, uh, full version of NBA 2K13. It's not, you know, a, a gimped off version with this feature missing and whatnot. It's very much our full game. Uh, and as far as what we've done with the gamepad, there's obviously a lot of unique opportunities there. Uh, we're going to be unveiling the full details of that very soon, but rest assured we have made uh, very good use of what we're going to be doing with that gamepad, so stay tuned for that. Great. And moving into our final questions, how were the, <laughs> how were the stats of the celebrity team players determined? Can you confirm there will be no Bieber dunks? <laughs> Bieber dunks. Um, well, for the celebs, typically when we meet them, they, uh, we ask them, you know, what, what NBA player do you want to be um, kind of modeled after? So and they always give us funny, funny answers, but um, that's usually, it's, it's usually a little bit of a, an augmentation of their actual real-life skills. So cool, you know, that's how they want to be in the game. But um, Bieber, I actually had the chance to play with Bieber, and um, he's a funny little guy. But uh, his, his thing was he wanted to be a com combination of Iverson and uh, I think it was Nate Robinson. So it's possible that he can dunk in the game. I'm not sure. I can't, I can't verify. <laughs> Commentary was strong last year. Any big improvements to it this year? Yeah, I think anyone who, who has played our game for the last five years knows that our commentary is incredibly strong. Uh, our audio department, headed by Joel Simmons, is unbelievably organized and incredibly passionate about what they do. Um, commentary has made a ton of improvements this year. A lot of it on the NBA Today side. We are going to see new segments, uh, more detailed commentary pertaining to real-world stats, uh, real-world events. Uh, just continuing to build upon our incredibly strong base. I know I referenced the time they spent in my career this year, making it more about me, uh, making the commentary in that mode more relevant to what I'm doing. Uh, so definitely, definitely a lot of improvements in there. I mean, it's hard, to, it's hard to detail a lot of commentary improvements when that's all we've been doing for five years. So people know what to expect from us, and it's going to continue to get better starting this year. And our last question is, will the PlayStation 3 version feature move support? We had um, move support within NBA 2K12. Uh, it was a feature that we didn't feel super strong about. We felt good when we were doing it at the end of the day when you got a chance to sit on your couch and play it and look back. We felt it needed a little more, a little more time under the hood maybe to, to get to where we wanted to be. Uh, we removed it this year to kind of spend that time you know, working on other aspects of the game while continuing to formulate ideas to improve this. So no, no move support this year, um, but we do have Connect support if you're on 360, so that's, that's the win this year. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining the call. Uh, Eric or Mike, do you guys have any closing comments? Sure, I'll go first. Uh, again, I just wanted to say uh, thanks, everyone, all our fans out there, for all the feedback and ideas that you guys provide to us. Um, we're very much a, uh, you know, a fan-driven company. We don't kind of sit at all in a round table after the game shifts and decide what direction the game is going to take. I mean, obviously, if that has to happen. So basically, all of our features come from feedback from our fans on that we get from email, that we get from the forums and websites. Um, I mean, we know the customers buy our games, so it would be foolish of us not to listen to that feedback and go in those directions. Um, and as far as NBA 2K13, uh, very proud of the game. A huge congratulations to our entire development team here. It is, without a doubt, the best-looking, best-playing basketball game ever made. Yeah, I, just, I mean, Eric kind of said it all. Thank you to the fans. And I think that, you know, it's, it's something that we say every year that, you know, we, we're really proud of the game and it's, it's the best it's ever been. But this year, it really it feels like it kind of turned a corner in, in a lot of ways from the gameplay standpoint, at least. I feel like we... We, we finally solved a lot of problems that have been lingering a lot in the NBA 2K series, and it feels like just a, a, a much much better feeling and looking game. It's kind of where we kind of put it all together, and so we're really looking forward to reading the feedback and uh, seeing how you guys like it. So thanks a lot.